you. Thank you very much. Wow. This is a, uh, we got people behind too. Hey, how's it going? All right, you have a nice view of my ass all night. Good for you. <laughs> How do we get these seats, man? That's fucked up. <laughs> How you guys doing? Thanks for having I'm going high tech with, uh, with uh, notes here. Hopefully it works. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> Apple, man. Yeah. <laughs> you guys like Apple? Yeah. Yeah, it doesn't matter, right? <laughs> well, thanks for having me here. At, uh, sir, could you leave before we start? That would be excellent. I appreciate it. Yeah, that was just, I don't know what it was. It was uh, something about that sweater was just bugging the shit out of me, man. Get out of here. <laughs> no. Apparently, nature is calling right away. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> thanks. I appreciate you having me here at the Chicago Humanities Festival. Is that what it's called? Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I, I guess a lot of people do know me. But I have to get used to this, so you have to excuse if I, if I feel a little disoriented. But uh, as a senior black correspondent on The Daily Show, and, um, and uh, you already applauded for that. I appreciate it. Yeah. <laughs> and I also am hosting a show on Showtime called Larry Wilmore's Race, Religion, and Sex. Uh, which actually we have another one tomorrow in Florida, so hopefully you can catch that. So, so they said, so why are you here, Larry? I said, Larry, would you mind talking about race? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Legitimate race, yes. <laughs> that I will. That I will do. If it's legitimate. <laughs> you guys will get some of this shit on the way home, too, up there. Don't worry about it. Let it sink in. But um, I thought, what a good opportunity to maybe talk about some of these issues. And what I thought I would do is, uh, since I've handled this a lot in my career, maybe talk a lot about uh, how I've handled race in both my career and my personal life, how I've kind of encountered it and give you some examples of those. And uh, then I'd love to read you uh, uh, one of my favorite chapters uh, from my book on race and maybe take some questions. How does that sound? Hmm. We'll see how it goes. And if you guys get too rowdy, out. <laughs> You're having trouble hearing? Oh, does it kind of get sucked in there, the sound? Can we turn it up maybe a little bit? How's, how's that? Is that better? Is that better? <laughs> how's that? Is that good? Yeah. Better? Okay, there we go. Sorry. I'll take all the blame. Um, anyhow, it is kind of extraordinary. Uh, I just had my birthday uh, last Tuesday. Thank you very much. Sure. I just turned uh, 51, it's hard to imagine, I'm 51. I was born in 1961, and it's kind of interesting that the world I was born into is a lot different from the world now. And I see some other, uh, let's say, grizzled faces here along with mine, right? <laughs> was it, isn't it amazing how much has changed? I mean, think about that. I, I wasn't born into a world that was black and white. I was born into a world that was uh, colored and white only. That's a big difference, and just think, in. 51 years, we may elect the first black president for a second term. That's extraordinary. That's a, it's hard to even, it's, it's, it's hard to even, to even put that, those two things together, how far that we've come, you know. And people ask me, they say, what do you think the most significant thing of the, uh, did everything come out okay, sir? <laughs> I'm sorry. Everything okay? Okay. okay. <laughs> Just making sure, you never know. So. Could you hear us in there, in the bathroom? Could you? Because we could hear you. We were playing it. <laughs> Just a joke. Just a joke. Just a joke. You went out to the car? Were you collecting numbers? Is that what you were doing? Oh, yeah. Right, okay. But uh, we're talking about how much race has changed and everything. Uh, one of the, I think one of the most significant parts of the Obama presidency, really to me, is the incidentalness of black leadership, you know? Like for kids, it's not that big of a deal that Obama is president. I mean, when I was a kid, you couldn't even have a black quarterback, <laughs> right? I mean, that's how fucked up it was, <laughs> where black people couldn't lead a black quarterback. And it's funny, because my barber, he's a little older than me, he still holds on to that idea. Like, it's still a sore point. Like, if, if a black quarterback messes up, it's always somebody, it's always racism that does it, right? <laughs> it's true. Like, Michael Vick can throw an interception. It's like, oh, man, it's because he's black. It's like, it's an interception, he threw it. They just don't like him. But, 
you know, he still holds on to that. You know, it's still, it's still important for him, you know. But I think with kids, it's, it's going to be different, you know, that whole, that whole notion. Like, if you ask kids, you know, about Michael Vick, they'll just say, eh, kind of sucks. And that <laughs> is Dr. King's dream. <laughs> the ability for a black kid to look at a black man in a position of leadership and go, eh, he kind of sucks. That's when we know we've come a long ways, right? <laughs> because, uh, and I, I think the other part about it is, um, you know, uh, people I think are still, you know, racism has its own thing, but I think people are still a little uncomfortable with black privilege. You know, we still aren't very comfortable with that. And a lot of people say, well, what's black privilege? I'll tell you what black privilege is. Uh, what, what, I, what I do is I'll give you the, what I call the first class test, okay? So go with me this. Imagine you're getting on a plane, you're in first class, and uh, first class is packed with white people, or as they say in the South, people. And you're walking through first class, right? What do you think? You're just thinking, man, first class is pretty packed, right? That's it, right? OK. You're getting on the same plane, walking through first class. This time it's packed with black people, with brothers, right? Teaming with brothers. It's a bro overflow. <laughs> right? Be honest, people. You know you're looking around going, what are the Lakers in town? What's going on? <laughs> right? <laughs> Be honest. <laughs> right? It's just we're just not used to that. I mean, even me, I'm checking my ticket. Is this going to Jamaica? What the? <laughs> are there snakes on this plane? <laughs> I just, I just want to know. I just want to know. <laughs> you know. But it's funny, racism definitely has changed. It definitely has. Uh, I, was, I saw that Ann Coulter has a book out now where she kind of, oh, Ann Coulter fans, very good. <laughs> Is she here? Okay. No, but uh, it's funny because in her book, she kind of links racist laws to racism. Like once racist laws goes away, racism goes with it. And okay, see, my family's actually from Chicago, from Evanston. You know that? Yeah. So I learned at a young age, it wasn't just laws that were racist. You know, people were racist, too. You know, who do you think made those racist laws, right? I mean, one of the most amazing things that my parents told me, we had to come back to Evanston for my grandmother, who, who was, um, she had passed away. And my father told me you know, how they had black cemeteries. So to me, I couldn't imagine that. Brothers had to be buried in a different graveyard? Are you kidding me? How racist can you get? That you're not only racist now, you say, no, no, mother, okay. I'm going to be racist in the next life, too. <laughs> That's how racist I am. I mean, that is amazing to me. You know? So we certainly have come, I think, a long way. You know? uh, it's funny, when I uh, think about um, how I first started viewing some of these issues, the first time I actually became aware of uh, Dr. King, I was a kid, it was uh, during the assassination, because before that, I, you know, I really didn't have much awareness of a lot of these issues. And I, I remember vividly, because my mom was crying, you know, and I was like, well, what's wrong? Why is she crying? And she said, you know, they killed Dr. King. And I was like, why would somebody kill a doctor? You know, <laughs> it didn't make sense. I couldn't understand it. I couldn't process it, you know. And I remember at the time, you guys remember Life Magazine, right? Some of you, trust me, young people, it was, they had these things called magazines. <laughs> <laughs> they were very nice, actually. I miss those things. But uh, Life magazine, they always had these big glossy pictures, and they, they used to have these plastic records that sometimes they would put in there. And I remember I took one out once, and it was the, um, the audio recording of Dr. King's I Have a Dream speech. And I was just a kid at the time, so I, I, I wasn't really aware of it. And I can vividly remember being like seven or eight years old, and that really moving me at the time, you know. I mean, for the first time, this is going to sound weird, but for the first time I felt like I, I knew that I was black. You know, does that make sense? Not in the negative way, like, I'm black? Hey, what the fuck? No, not like that, right? <laughs> but I became aware of that as an identity. You know, it was real interesting. My mom, she was really into, um, you know, the whole black pride movement and all of that stuff when we were growing up. Uh, I remember she had the afro, all that kind of stuff. My father had a dashiki. Uh, <laughs> I think he still has that dashiki. Yeah. Dashikis are not right, right? <laughs> I don't know. I was never really connected to the whole Africa thing, you know. And then Africa just always made me think hot, <laughs> right? You know, and stuff there that might eat me. <laughs> and brothers who speak French, which I don't believe is in God's plan. So, 
<laughs> right. Right. I kind of missed that. Because like, I didn't mind being called black, for one thing, you know. Because uh, that's when uh, the whole African-American thing came in. And black people, we change our names more than porn stars. It really is ridiculous. <laughs> it really is. I mean, we were like, uh, what was it, colored, right? And then Negro, and then black, and then uh, Afro-American. Right? We were named after a hairstyle. <laughs> Think how crazy that got. I mean, white people, you weren't ever called beehive Americans, right? <laughs> right? Seriously. <laughs> what should we call ourselves? Fucking Afro-American. Huh? <laughs> I mean, it's just ridiculous. But it got even more convoluted. It was like Americans of African descent, then black again, and then uh, people of color. That was nice. Yeah, I kind of, yeah, that was nice. Black again, nappy-headed hoes. And now, <laughs> just making sure you're paying attention. <laughs> and now, uh, African-American, you know. But, uh, I, th I think it was interesting. Uh, it, you know, it just, African American just doesn't mean as much as black. Like, uh, Charlize Theron is African American as far as I'm concerned. Right? <laughs> Probably more African American than me. But I just want to make sure that, like, uh, black always had a different des designation than that, you know. But um, it's funny because uh, my mom, my mom thinks everybody's black. She thinks everybody has black in them, you know. And, and she'll, she'll look at people and go, <laughs> you guys can't see. She is black. <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, mom, she's like, she is black. I'm like, oh, look at that hair. I'm like, mom, look at that butt. I'm like, mom, Hillary Clinton is not black, man. She's not. She's not. <laughs> so Hillary's from here, isn't she? <laughs> But people are fascinated with that whole issue of what's in you. They want to know what you're made of, you know, what's inside of you. People, people always do that to me, you know. They always, they always give me that look to the go, are you? Mm. <laughs> I have to do these twice now. Are you? Mm. <laughs> are you mixed with something? <laughs> 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 I just tell people, I say, look, if I was a beer, I'd be a Negro light, okay? It's not. <laughs> and I am a third less angry than the regular Negro, so <laughs> it all works out. Thank you very much. It all works out. But <laughs> if we had Racebook instead of Facebook, I could just say, it's complicated. <laughs> Simple as that. But I was always fascinated how a little bit of black always made you black, you know? That's what the key was, right? A little bit of black, just didn't matter how, a little bit, like the black was the contaminant or something. You'd always tell people, say, look, the cream was poured into the coffee, not the other way around, man. <laughs> I'm just gonna take my time in some of this. Man. Some of this stings a little Chicago, it's all right. <laughs> We're all in it together. But identity is very, very important to us. One thing I've noticed about identity is people, they always want you to be whatever it is you're supposed to be. Have you noticed that? They really do. You know, it doesn't matter what it is. You're a scrappy little guy, right? Jolly fat guy. Hey man, how come you're not laughing? You're fat, <laughs> right? What's wrong, jolly fat guy? <laughs> right? Latin lover. I'm a Latin and I'm a lover. <laughs> cool black guy, right? Jew. <laughs> That's a fucked up one, man. <laughs> Jews are like, how come it's just that? I like smart Asian. That's my favorite. Because Asians are, they're actually upset with their stereotype. You know, you know OK, how about let's trade? How about that, Asian, right? Yeah, you take some of ours. I'll gladly take your stereotype. Yeah. Yeah, here, you can have that one, that one. No, 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 give me big dick back. Give it back. Give it back. <laughs> no, no. I'll beat you with it. Don't make I apologize. For <laughs> All the subscribers are going, we subscribe to this? <laughs> 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 
No, but we are. We're obsessed with identity. We want things to be exactly what we say they should be. You know, I mean, I work in television. One of the, the funniest notes ever given by an executive to a writer was uh, Leonard Stern. He used to write for The Honeymooners, and he wrote this show, called, this show called My Favorite Martian. And he actually got a note from an executive that said, Martians don't talk like that. <laughs> Seriously, <laughs> we even know how Martians are supposed to sound now. Oh, does, it, does it never end, right? <laughs> a Martian wouldn't say that. That's what it was. A Martian wouldn't. Right. Thanks, thanks. <laughs> people, always, people would always do that with me growing up. That people would say I didn't talk black, you know, which I never quite understood. You know, because I always felt, well, I'm talking. And I'm black. <laughs> Ergo. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm talking black. Yeah. Maybe brothers just shouldn't say ergo. Yeah. <laughs> Could have been my first mistake, I guess. <clears throat> but uh, it's funny because I remember going through some things where talking black was actually a liability. I remember. A friend of mine in college, he was trying to rent a, uh, a place, and it would say vacant, but when he would call on the phone, because he had what we call a heavy black accent. <laughs> he would call on the phone, you know, he couldn't, uh, you know, suddenly there was no vacancies. So uh, I would call and use my non-heavy black accent, suddenly vacancy. Mm -hmm. So I, I actually came up with this bit, I remember my early stand-up called Black Away, where you put this stuff in your mouth. <laughs> It takes the black right out of your voice. Very nice. <laughs> that was one of the first bits that I wrote, actually, in stand-up. You know, Revolutionary new black away. <laughs> Those things really happened, you know, really happened. People are always shocked when I tell them about incidents of, of racism, you know, but these things are true, you know. Um, I, I actually have three instances in my life that really stand out to me the most. Uh, and they all involve the uh, N-word. You know. But uh, one was uh, the first time, well, well, I guess one that really stands out to me, I was dating a girl, um, let's just say she was not black. <laughs> and uh, I remember we were walking down the street, and a car drove by, and just the N-word just flew out. You know. That's what it sounded like. I mean, I knew what it was. And it was weird, too, because it was like, very unsettling, you know. That was like in the early 80s, too, and, you know, I didn't know what to think. I was a little scared, didn't know what to do, you know. But I didn't let it bother me. I just kind of shrugged it off. Another time was when I was doing stand-up in uh, South Carolina. He <laughs> goes like, first of all, Larry, what were you doing in South Carolina? <laughs> I appreciate it. Bless you, somebody see? Yeah. And, uh, and I remember somebody said it, like, it, it couldn't have been more than the first five minutes of my act. I swear to God, somebody yelled at it. I don't even know what the context was. It was just so ridiculous. And I remember thinking at the time that, you know, as a comic, you know, you slam people, somebody says something, you know, you have your remark, and you slam them, and you get a laugh, and you move on, right? I mean, that's what, that's what your job is, right? You know, you slam a heckler. But I remember at that time, I just couldn't do it. I could not do it, you know? I thought, I can't make a joke out of this right now. You know, and I remember just looking at the audience and saying, sorry guys, that's it. And I walked off, only time I've ever walked off stage. I've been on stage five times. It was, I, I don't know what it was, and it just hit, it, well, of course it hit me the wrong way. I mean, that was, <laughs> right. Larry, you were called the N-word. You know? It was pretty bad. Uh, I think the most indelible time it ever happened to me, um, I was a kid, I was maybe seven or eight, and uh, our neighbors were, uh, well, they weren't the, uh, <laughs> The best uh, kind of neighbors, I guess you could say. Uh, and I remember uh, there was some, something that happened in the house and the, the police had come over. We could hear them in the backyard. My brother and I, you know, we were about eight or nine years old. We were little. We rushed over to see what was going on, you know. And I had never had that much experience, you know, with the police at that time. I, I didn't know what was going on. It was kind of exciting for us, you know, because in those days, cowboys and Indians, all that stuff, right? And so the police are rushing up. We see them rush up to the back door and we're like looking over the window, we're looking to see what's happening. And he runs, runs up there and he actually uh, goes up to the door. I think he bangs in it. Or he, he uh, I think they kicked it open or something like that. And I swear to God, 
He pulls out his gun and he says, freeze nigga dead. Freeze nigga dead. I mean, imagine, I'm eight years old and I hear the police say those words, freeze nigga dead, you know. And at the time, I didn't know what to make of it. I was young, you know, but my brother and I talked about it for years and years. It always stuck with us, you know, those those words that in an instant, in an instant, who, you know, that person in that house could not only be dead, but, you know, he was already dehumanized at the same time. I didn't have all those words at the time, but I remember it left such an indelible impression on me. And now when I look back, um, sometimes I almost feel like that could have been the moment, because my brother and I, we used to make fun of things all the time, but I think it could have been the moment where I decided this was kind of the grist of stuff that I probably have to make fun of you know, in my life, if you can believe that. Now I make fun of it all the time, <laughs> the N-word, I guess. You know, and it is controversial getting jokes from that word. I understand that. I understand there's history with it and everything. And I try to be satirical with it. I try to do it in my own way or whatever. You know, and sometimes people say, well, maybe doing that takes some of the sting and power out of that. I'm not sure, you know, if it does or not. Um, some of the things that I remember, uh, I did this show called The PJs. Anybody remember that? <laughs> I'm begging for applause. Right, right. <laughs> oh, thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Sir, could you go to the bathroom again? <laughs> it was the animated show uh, that took place uh, in the projects, PJs. And, um, and uh, we actually had a crackhead on the show. I'm <laughs> so wrong. <laughs> And, uh, and he smoked crack, that's what he, we didn't, not on camera, but he was like, well, super, gotta go, crack don't smoke itself, you know. And <laughs> that was his job, that's what he did. But, but I remember, I, I remember I actually had to defend that show to the NAACP, it was so, so ridiculous. Because having to defend a cartoon, basically, you know. Because they were very concerned that it might be racist or whatever, and I understood, you know. And, uh, and I was saying, yeah, but, you know, you know, they said, but the characters drink a lot. I said, well, they drink a lot. On, on Family Guy had just come out. They said, they drink a lot on Family Guy. In fact, in the pilot, the dad drinks till he's drunk and passes out on the table. And they said, yeah, but your characters are real. I said, they're puppets! <laughs> <laughs> but that's how important some of these issues are. So I remember uh, one bit that we did on there. Thurgood and the kids were looking through an old radio station that they found. And they found one of Richard Pryor's old albums. And uh, I think it was called this, That Nigger's Crazy was the name of it. And we didn't say it on the show. He just holds it up. And, was, and uh, the kid says, hey, Super, can we play this? He says, play it. We can't even say it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> it was one instance of it. Um, of course, in my book, I make uh, fun of it a lot. <laughs> I say fun of it a lot. I don't know if that's right. But uh, I like to kind of take my satirical approach, because the NAACP, I remember once they were going to uh, they had like a mock burial of the N-word. You know? And I thought, well, that, I don't know. Did the N-word get a fair trial? <laughs> so I have a fair trial uh, in the book. And then I felt, I wonder if anyone actually did the eulogy for the N-word. You know? <laughs> also have that in my book, so. <laughs> my approach is on it. And then on The Daily Show, uh, uh, actually in The Office, a uh, show that I wrote on uh, the first three seasons, I played a the uh, Diversity Day uh, consultant. Uh, oh, thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah, Mr. Brown. <laughs> Where uh, Steve Carell, now this is surreal. So Steve Carell doesn't get any whiter than Steve Carell. God bless him. <laughs> right? Really? And again, and the nicest guy in the world. I think he's from Chicago, I think. See? The nicest guy in the world, right? Very funny and everything. So we're doing this scene. And keep in mind, this is like the first episode of The Office, so we don't even know what the show is yet. It's right after the pilot. And so we're doing this, and the whole scene is he's explaining the Chris Rock routine, uh, where Chris Rock says, see, there's a war between black people and niggas, and the niggas do this, and black people do this, and the niggas, and he's doing that. And, and Steve's character gets in trouble for saying this routine at work, and that's why they have to bring me in the Diversity Day consultant, <laughs> right? So that's the premise of it. So Steve, so we're, you know, they're encouraging us to do a lot of ad-libbing <laughs> during this scene, right? And so Steve's getting a little too much into this as he's doing it, you know. 
because he keeps doing it over and over. He's like, okay, cut, okay, let's do it again. And the niggas, and the niggas, and then and the niggas, and I'm looking at the motherfucker, what the fuck's going on? <laughs> yeah, but a little too much fun doing that, you know. <laughs> oh, man. The Daily Show, I've been able to do it a couple of times. I think uh, that'd have been interesting. We're uh, in uh, New York. A councilman wanted to ban the N-word. This is a true thing. So John Oliver and I went out and we tortured him. <laughs> oh, God, we tortured him. Because you know? <laughs> I just thought that was ridiculous. You can't really ban words. In fact, we, I did another piece on, um, on The Daily Show about how, remember when Mark Twain, they wanted to take it out of Huckleberry Finn. You guys remember that? Yeah, and, uh, and I thought that was wrong. Why change history, literature? It doesn't make sense, you know? And uh, they wanted to change nigger to slave, as if that would somehow soften. <laughs> right. Oh, whew, thank God. <laughs> you know, that's going to soften the blow some kind of way. And I said in the piece, which, you know, I really agree with, is that Twain's point was that, uh, you know, he was a runaway slave, that, Jim could run away from being a slave, but he couldn't run away from being a nigger. That is a very, very good point that needs to be in there, you know. So, anyhow. People say, well, Larry, what is, where is racism now? What is the new racism? <clears throat> in some ways, I almost think the gay issue is, uh, is almost the new racism, if you will. I mean, racism still is the old racism. <laughs> <laughs> How many people think the gay issue is, is, is our civil rights issue of today? Yeah. And not to compare it to the race issue, I think they're different, they have some similarities, they overlap a bit. I've talked about it in my stand-up, you know, I mean, black is not the same as gay, because, I mean, black, we don't have to, we don't have to come out of the closet, right? <laughs> right? It's like, Mom, Dad, I'm black. What? <laughs> right? Well, how long has this been going on? I felt this way all my life. Bullshit, you've been hanging out with those Negroes down by the railroad. <laughs> Mom comes out of the bedroom with an Ebony and Jet magazine. I found these under his mattress. <laughs> Look. <laughs> Bad. <laughs> so it's not, it's not quite the same thing. You know? And they were never slaves either. Yeah, we got that one. No, I'm like, you have to brag about it. <laughs> So that's some of the differences. I think what we both share, though, is what I call the invisibility cloak. You know, where I always felt blacks were invisible because people didn't see us, and gays were invisible because they don't want to be seen. So, you know, in that way, there's some similarities. You know, but I think gay marriage is an issue where it brings up a lot of people's like core beliefs. You know, and I think the issue at the heart of it really is that I think people don't quite want to accept homosexual lifestyle. Do you think that's it? And if you accept gay marriage as an institution, you say, okay, that's cool. I think that's that dividing line. It's that core belief, you know, is what it threatens. Do you think so? Because we, you already have a domestic partnership and a civil, civil marriage, or not civil marriage, what is it, civil unions? Right. Do you have any gay people here? <laughs> Don't fucking lie to me, Chicago. <laughs> How many people for gay marriage? people? Some people not? That's okay. How many? Be honest. How many people not? <laughs> Be honest. Not? Mm -hmm. In the balcony? In the balcony? Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, you know, I, I understand why, why some I mean, look. I, for me, I don't understand why gay guys want to get married. I mean, lesbians, I get it. Women like weddings, I get it, right? <laughs> right? That makes sense. That makes sense. But I don't think gay guys have thought this through completely. You know, who are gay guys in here? <laughs> right here, Larry. <laughs> no, I mean, it is illegal. You guys need to use that. Straight guys would love to have that. Are you kidding me? Honey, I love you, let's get married. I can't. <laughs> it's against the law. <laughs> need to hold on to that one. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, man. 
But it's funny how, uh, I don't want you to think, I'm not hobophobic. I'm not homophobic. <laughs> right, I'm homophobic. <laughs> I have a fear of bums. <laughs> An inordinate fear. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> no, but I think uh, it's, it's the way some people hold on. I actually saw this congressman once. He said, uh, homosexuality is not an orientation, it's just a bad habit. <laughs> that they all pick, a habit? <laughs> I mean, what do you think it was like, smoking? Care for a penis? Oh, no thanks, man. <laughs> I'm trying to cut down. <laughs> Wearing that patch now, that's working out real good. <laughs> yeah. It just eases them into my system. I apologize, ma'am, that's hard. You don't have to. <laughs> I was looking at you the whole time, like, oh my God. I said, motherfucker, I said, nigga. Oh my God, what have we seen? <laughs> oh man. So people say, is racism still bad? I, like I said, I don't think it's as bad. I guess it can still, you know, pop up here and there. <laughs> Gotta keep your eye on it. It's like whack a mole, <laughs> just to make sure, <laughs> you know. What I don't like, I don't like when people, uh, use prison to describe how bad racism is. You know, that, to me, it lowers the bar so much when you talk about how long people who smoke crack have to spend in prison. Because when I was, I mean, when I was a kid, the proof of racism was girls being blown up in a church. You know, I don't think Martin Luther King envisioned the day when crackheads and cokeheads would come together singing free at last, free at last, right? <laughs> <laughs> so that does bug me a bit. Mm. I don't think it's racist that I voted for a black president because he's black. Mm -hmm. I did, voted for Obama because he's black. Mm -hmm. Keeps me off the hook. Larry, how do you think Obama's doing? Is he still black? <laughs> he's doing a pretty fucking awesome job. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right? The second time, a little different, but the first time. No, because you should get a pass when you're voting for the first, right? Catholics voted for Kennedy, got a pass, right? First Catholic, it's true. Women voted for Hillary, could have been the first woman, get a pass, right? I don't have to agree with everything Obama stands for. I don't even know what half of it is. A Alan Keyes, well, no, he's too crazy. He couldn't have <laughs> <laughs> Whatever brother was running would have gotten my vote. You know? Now, also the first Latino to run is not gonna have to go courting that Latino vote, right? Buckle up, white people, that day is coming fast. <laughs> it's true. It is. It's on its way. And good luck finding any of those birth certificates. <laughs> that was not good. I shouldn't have said that. <laughs> I don't appreciate that, Larry. That's wrong, man. <laughs> <laughs> but people always ask me, say, Larry, well, are the attacks on Obama racist? Can people, like, criticize him and not be racist? No. No. I'm just <laughs> <laughs> no, of course. You know. But I think racist attacks are racist. <laughs> you know. Like, the whole Bertha thing, I'm sorry, that is racist. I don't care what anybody says. It just is. Leave him alone, you know, give him the benefit of the doubt. You know, and what about the secret Muslim stuff? I don't even understand that stuff. Thinking Obama is a secret, how can you be a secret Muslim? <laughs> how are you president of the United States and you sneak praying to Allah five times a day, right? <laughs> how does that work? It's a, oop, drop my contact lens, I'll get, no, I got it. <laughs> Assalamu alaikum. <laughs> hey, I found it, I found it, it's right here. It was right here the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> Sunset, oop, dropped it again. No, no, no. You guys go ahead, I'll just look for it. <laughs> Sometimes you gotta do what you gotta do. That's my Obama, thank you very much. Is it? A little bit, I'm working on it. I hope I still have time. <laughs> it's so sad. Oh man, yeah. You know what it is, Obama, he just takes too long to get to the point when he's, when he's not making a speech. It just takes, like, you just ask him what he had for uh, breakfast. It's like, uh, for, uh, uh, 
uh, <laughs> breakfast. Uh, <laughs> uh, there was uh, 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 some uh, sort of a, a decorative uh, plate. Man, I'm hungry. Because yeah. Bush would have just said eggs. <laughs> <laughs> Got it right there. <laughs> Pop tarts. <laughs> Cherry. <laughs> I like gravy on my Pop tarts. That impression never gets old. Oh, man. It's nice to be here in Chicago. Chicago, um, I remember uh, in 1984 how excited I was when Jesse Jackson ran for president. To me, it's funny because Jesse was the first first. <laughs> you know, the first, because I think, didn't he win South Carolina to bring South Carolina back up or something like that? I mean, that was amazing to me at the time. You know, there was so much excitement, I remember, when Jesse was running. So, um, one of the first bits I did, I thought I would do it here, if you guys don't mind. Uh, it's one of my first stand-up bits. This was my first political comedy bit. And I'm going to bring it back for you. But uh, <laughs> it was kind of so. I was doing impressions. It was, uh, I was saying how all politicians lie, right? The only one that didn't lie was George Washington. His father asked him if he chopped down the cherry tree. He said, yes, right? That's the setup, I know. I, I apologize for the horrible setup. But I said, you know, what if other politicians had chopped down their tree? So I would start with Nixon. You guys are old enough for, to remember Nixon, so. Yeah, so good. Richard, did you chop down my tree? Uh, uh, well, uh, uh, you know, Daddy, uh, <laughs> I, uh, looking in retrospect, uh, <laughs> I can firmly say that, although I did authorize <laughs> the initial break-in of the tool shed, uh, <laughs> I must say that that, in no significant way, uh, links me to the actual chopping. <laughs> yeah, blah, 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 chopping, chopping. Blah, blah, blah. No, I can't even do it anymore. No, 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 no. Just explaining. I'm just explaining it so I can get to the good part. Okay. And then I would do, I think I did Carter. Oh, let's, I didn't chop it. I chopped it in my heart. It was something stupid like that. Right? <laughs> Reagan, I can't even say, well, what was the question again? There, <laughs> there you go again. <laughs> Blamed it on Carter, probably. But then the whole point was that I would get to uh, Jesse, you know, so that was my favorite part. So I was like, Jesse, come here. Did you chop down my tree? Uh, well, Daddy, uh, the question uh, is uh, not whether or not I chopped down your tree as much as do I believe in the tree's right to exist. <laughs> On that point, I do. Furthermore, Daddy, I believe in the rights of all trees. I think it is wrong to merely address the plight of the cherry tree alone. There's the apple tree, the orange tree, the fig tree. They have been locked out of the garden. Daddy, we need to, we need to include all the trees into the garden along with the rose bush, along with the shrubs, in order to form a total shrubbery coalition. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> that was my first, first political event. Yeah. Where is Jesse? Is he still around? He was crying when Obama won. Right? That should have been me. You know it's true. You know, you know that shit is true. Right? <laughs> Everybody. <laughs> that brother stole my thunder. Mm -hmm. Okay, anyhow, um, I thought I'd like to read uh, my favorite uh, chapter from uh, my book, which is kind of a collection of fake uh, stories and fake things as if I wrote them over the years and somebody collected them all into a book. <laughs> so, like, I, like I have a, a fake radio interview with the man, you know? In here, where even though the man's job is to keep brothers down, he appears to be very charming. So I can't get over it. And actually, someone interviewed me once and said, So you had a radio show? I said, No, it's fake. I made it up. <laughs> so, so you interviewed the man. The man, it, I made it up. It's fake. I never had a radio so I just want you to know it's fake, the stuff I read. So, 
So, <laughs> so this one is called The End of Racism. In one of Wilmore's more controversial pieces, he contemplates a world without racism. I hate racism. It's one of the worst scourges to ever afflict mankind. So many awful things in the world would have never existed but for racism. If it was responsible only for slavery and nothing else, it would still be hard to beat. Pound for pound, racism is hands down the worst of all the isms. Well, if this is all true, don't we want it to stop? Don't we want to see the end of racism? Well, it ain't necessarily so. Now, I know this may sound heretical to some, but when it comes to racism, I'm overly cautious. I just know that racism is sneaky. Personally, even if it did end, I would never believe it. Like a persistent cold sore, racism can rear its ugly head at the most inopportune situations. <laughs> Plus, it takes time. We didn't get this racist overnight. It's like losing weight. It took thousands of years to put all that hatred on our thighs. You just can't go on, on an Oprah fat in the wagon crash diet and expect it to melt away. John Lennon knew how hard it was. He changed imagine no racism to imagine no possessions because even he couldn't imagine no racism. <laughs> no, we have to acknowledge that it's here to stay, at least for the time being. And we better learn to accept it and move on. To be honest with you, I'm not even sure if I want it to go. Whoa, 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 Larry, what the F? I did that for your benefit. <laughs> <laughs> racism is bad. Yeah, but so is putting people out of work. Now what's gonna happen to Al Sharpton, Jesse, and all the other angry pre preachers if racism goes away? I'll tell you what's gonna happen, they'll be in the unemployment line. Do you know how humiliating that would be for men of their stature to have to hear some overworked government employee ask them, did you find any racism today? <laughs> did you look for any racism today? That is not right, no. Now, people always say race relations have come a long way but let's acknowledge that they still need to go further. Why? I mean, what if we've peaked? What if this is as far as we really should go? I mean, don't we need some tension and conflict to keep life interesting? Look, I for one can say that interracial sex would not nearly be as exciting if it weren't for racism. <laughs> In fact, that's the whole point. I propose that as ugly as racism is, and it's real ugly, maybe it needs to stick around for a while. Now, unfortunately, it's part of our family. And if you had an ugly member of your family, you wouldn't be clamoring for ways to get rid of him or her. You'd try to get along the best you could. Okay, Larry, now you've gone too far. No, hey, hear me out. I think I've got a handle on this. First of all, not everything that seems racist is racist. Okay, the problem is that people are so touchy these days, everything gets that label just to avoid conflict. So what ends up happening is more conflict is created by falsely labeling a non-racist incident. Well, if it sounds racist and feels racist, but it's not racist, what is it? There's a better term. It might just not be brother friendly. <laughs> my first question. Damn. Brother friendly is a term that needs to be in our daily racial jargon. It doesn't replace racist or bigot, but provides a soft landing area for situations that don't call for such harsh accusations. It's the penumbra for intolerance, if you will. The penumbra is the space between shadow and light. So brother friendly can be the penumbra between ignorance and enlightenment. Okay, for example, it would be easy for a young brother in South Central Los Angeles to label a Korean grocer racist because she won't take her eyes, her eyes off him while he's shopping. But what if she's not racist? What if she got hornswoggled by another brother who was shoplifting a few days earlier and is just a tad leery? She doesn't think blacks are inferior, she's just not very brother friendly. <laughs> See? So brother friendly is a term we should embrace to slowly wean us off the word racist and get used to the idea of naked intolerance. Right? In other words, we must look forward to the day when we can hate someone not for the color of their skin, but for the content of their character. <laughs> yes. Well, if we're to reach this utopia, we've got a lot of work to do. First of all, we need some sort of campaign to educate the public on Brother Friendly as soon as possible. The more people are able to understand and use this distinction, the easier things get. Here's a few examples to get us started. Okay, rednecks used to be racist, now just not Brother Friendly. White trash used to be not Brother Friendly, now by and large Brother Friendly. The government, used to be racist and not brother friendly, now somewhat racist, but also somewhat brother friendly. 
Country music, racist but brother friendly. <laughs> Country singers, not racist but not brother friendly. <laughs> the Simpsons, not racist but not very brother friendly. Family Guy, racist but very brother friendly. <laughs> okay. Menthol cigarettes, racist but unfortunately very brother friendly. <laughs> Democrats, used to be racist and not brother friendly. They're still racist but very brother friendly. Republicans used to be very racist, but brother friendly. Party of Lincoln, not just a tad racist, but not very brother friendly. That one's kind of complicated. <laughs> Basketball, not racist and very brother friendly. Hockey, not racist, but not very brother friendly. <laughs> this all makes sense. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Golf, racist, but getting more brother friendly. Tiger. Golf country clubs, racist and not brother friendly. <laughs> See the difference? Sushi, not racist, but not very brother friendly. <laughs> Watermelon and fried chicken, very racist, but extremely brother friendly. <laughs> now these are just a few examples to get us jump started. Once we have a better understanding of the issues that divide us, we can divide over us and not the issues. But it's not going to be easy. For one thing, brothers tend to see racism in just about everything. I know a brother who tried to convince me that hurricanes were racist. I'm serious. No, it's true. He said, well, they gather off the coast of Africa, then head across the ocean till they reach the deep south. What does that remind you of? <laughs> yeah. He then added, and why are there no hurricanes with black names? What does that tell you? I have to admit he had a point. Hurricanes do seem pretty racist. And the only ones with even remotely black names were Wanda and Bertha. I looked it up. <laughs> well, maybe I'm deluding myself. Maybe racism is so strong and virulent that the only solution is to call it out, even, even when we're wrong, in an effort to destroy it completely. And if we can do that, we can really achieve a truly utopian world. Of course, utopia comes from the Greek word ou, which means not or no, and topos, which means place. In other words, utopia literally means no place. Well, utopia may not be racist, but it sure doesn't sound very brother friendly. <laughs> Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Very good. Oh, thank you. You feel good? Right? You feel okay? So, so? Okay. That's okay. What was it the question was on? <laughs> Just checking with her, because she's the only one that matters, really. Yeah. <laughs> okay, we'd love to ta uh, open it up for some questions. If you guys have some, we'll do a nice lively discussion. I think we have microphones for people set up somewhere. Are the microphones here? And there's one. Oh, and there's one here. Okay. Um, <laughs> everybody's on this side, of course. <laughs> uh, sh should we just throw microphones to people, or just yell it, or just yell it out? Is it for for uh, because you're recording it? Is that what it is? Sorry. We, oh God. Sorry. Uh, what do you want to do? There you go. Uh, do you have a question? Okay, let's just try this then. Okay. There we go. All right, go for it. Oh, you have a question. Oh, since sorry. yeah, uh, since you travel a lot more yes. than I do, I was wondering. How do you what know you... I travel more? Than well, you. you're famous. Oh. Um, so, do you have uh, a prediction on the election outcome? Do I have a prediction? Yeah. Woo! Um, the guy with the white mom's gonna win. <laughs> it's close, though. It's close. The other guy could pull it out, too. We'll see. I think it's pretty even, don't you? Yeah? No? How many people think Obama's gonna win? How many, uh, how many people think Romney? I really? In Chicago? Bye. <laughs> yeah. When you go in the voting booth. Sorry, Obama. <laughs> um, yes, who's next? Yeah, I'm not going to. Okay, go. I come up. You were reminiscing a little bit when you were talking about Jesse Jackson. Yes. In 1984 in South Carolina. Mm -hmm. You said, 
how you were really excited. And yeah. I couldn't help but think we're about the same age. Uh -huh. and, you know, how much of that was because you were, you know, in your early 20s at the time. Right. And so what, what today would you say now, 30 years later, perhaps be a little more cynical and jaded? About uh, Jesse? Who excites you today uh, the way you felt about Jesse? I don't know if anybody excites me like that. Um, <laughs> Well, that was a special moment in time, you know. I mean, I think maybe 16 years earlier, he was on that balcony with Dr. King with his blood on him. 16 years later, he's winning South Carolina. That's a short amount of time. I mean, you can imagine how I felt during that period of time. That's why it was so magnified, you know. That kind of feeling, I mean, different groups get different excitements for whatever reasons. That's why I mentioned the uh, first. I think when something is first, it's just more intense, you know. But I tend to distrust all politicians. That's my starting position. <laughs> That's my starting position. Like, I say I never give money to politicians because their job, their job is to convince me to vote for them, not the other way around, you know. I did give Obama a pass. <laughs> but, um, but I'm voting for Obama now because um, I want to give him another chance. I, I think he needs more time to handle the economy. And um, I think... Uh, I just think the attacks on him haven't really taken into account how bad things really were. You know, it really doesn't. I understand political statements and everything, but I, I do think it's unrealistic. It's, and it's going to take years to really pull out of this. I think, no matter who's president. I do like Romney, though. I think he's very competent, very capable. So I have nothing. To, no, you don't think so. Anybody that changes his mind that much is fucking smart. Come on. He's smart. <laughs> yes, who's next? Yes, I think we're doing without the microphones. Oh, my, oh, okay, great. Yes, oh, there you go, sorry. I wondered how your title came about at the show. Senior Black Correspondent? <laughs> uh, well, we were looking for something to call me. <laughs> Everybody was senior something. We always make fun of the, the news. And I always laugh at, you know, whenever there's something bad happening in the black neighborhoods, that's when I see the black correspondent on the news. <laughs> that's how it was in LA. Like during the riots, I had never seen more black news people than during the LA riots. <laughs> it was unbelievable. I'm like, where did these people come from? You know? <laughs> so uh, DJ Jabberbaum, our head writer, came up with that name. So, yes. Next. Yes. All right, you got your own microphone. <laughs> Larry, I just take it with me. <laughs> um, I'm asking you this because I'd love to be a comedy writer, maybe oh, for great. The Daily Show. And I was just wondering if you could talk, thank you. Um, and I was just wondering if you could talk about maybe some of the key things that maybe you did or that happened to you as you were kind of, you know, writing and trying to get to the level that you're at now. So, so you want me to take an hour and? and... <laughs> I have an hour, if you have an hour. <laughs> <laughs> you have a... Well, here's what I will tell you. God bless you for being a writer, too, because you don't have to wait for anything to be a writer. You can just write. You know, like a lot of actors, it's tough because they're waiting tables. And it's like, are you an actor or are you waiting to be an actor? You know, this, it's really tough. But as a writer, you can just write all the time. That's how I started. I started as a stand-up, and, and I started as an actor as well. I, I kind of did both at the same time. I had a lot of classical training in theater, Shakespeare, and that kind of stuff, and playwriting. But um, I always wrote just all the time. I would just write. And after a while, something funny pops out. So keep doing that. If you're a comedy writer, send your stuff to people who are funny who might buy it. And then you'll get notice. And you have the internet now, too, which I didn't have. So you have a lot of good opportunities. Yeah. Yeah. Get it. Yes, in the back. In the back so we can not hear it right here. When did I leave Evanston? I never lived here. My, my parents lived in Evanston. And uh, most of my relatives are from Chicago. My father uh, moved out uh, west right before I was born. His grandparents had lived in Pasadena for a while, too. But all of, all of my peeps, all of my family is here. Yep. Yep. Chicago. Yes. Balcony. So I don't think that microphone works. <laughs> Right. That's, that's truthful. Right. That a lot of entertainment, a lot of news outlets, and he 
Right. right. How do we decide what we put in? Uh, we use uh, truth and evidence. <laughs> That's what we use. It's pretty simple. We go, what really happened? <laughs> what is the truth? And what is the evidence? Now let's write some funny shit about that. You know? <laughs> That's pretty much how The Daily Show works. But I have to be honest with you, John Stewart, his integrity is, you know, it's right top notch. You know? He's never going to put anything on. No, John is great. He really is amazing. But we really, the integrity is because of who he is, you know, with, with getting things right and with being fair or whatever. But it's also in being funny and looking at something in a way where maybe people aren't. But it is, it is interesting that a lot of people get their news. I don't know if it's sad or what from The Daily Show. It's really not right if they're getting it from Colbert, though. That makes no sense at all. <laughs> Seriously, that makes no sense. <laughs> Daily Show and Colbert are two shows that are <laughs> okay. Just saying. Just saying. Just saying. Daily Show's funnier, I think. No, 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 no. Okay, next. Yes. I saw yes. Donald Glover recently do stand up and he suggested right. that a way to combat the use He's from community? Mm hmm Yeah. I think he started at the Daily Show. He was a oh, really? PA, I think, or something there. Intern. Huh. Um, he suggested the way to combat the use of the N-word is to, as a society, overuse the N-word to make it meaningless. Ha! And I was wondering what you had to say about that. Overuse the N-word? Yeah, you're going to talk these people into that. Right? <laughs> what, like the smoke and the cigarettes until you get sick, like your parents did? Or... I don't know. I don't, I don't think there's any one thing. I think, uh, actually, I actually did that as a joke of when we were torturing that... Uh, that councilman um, banning the N-word. This, this didn't make the air, but... Uh, and he was so horrified, too, which even made me go further, right? So, and I swear to God, I'm not making this up. I said the N-word about 50 times in a row when I was doing this. And this is how I said it. I said, well, don't you, know, don't you think if you ban the N-word, if you tell kids not to do it, they're just going to want to do it. So if you tell kids not to say nigga all day long, they're going to go nigga, 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 And I sat there, and I said it about 50 or 60 times, I swear to God, and his face was unbelievable. Couldn't believe it. That was satire. That was different. If it's not satirical, I would not suggest it, unless you want to get killed or beaten up. But you're a nice-looking girl. I don't think anything's going to happen. <laughs> she leaves here. Larry said I could say nigga, what's up, my nigga? <laughs> right. Should we do should we do one more? Just one more and then we'll go? Okay. Yes. <laughs> the electoral college? Okay, let me just clear one thing up. I am a fake news guy. Okay. <laughs> I'm not real. <laughs> I don't have the answers. I really don't have the answers. Um, I think one answer, though, I would really love to see a viable third party be significant. I really do. I think um, I personally call myself a passionate centrist. I think there's a lot of people whose ideas fall on both sides. We already have two parties representing these sides. There's people who are reasonable people who are passionate about being right in there. And I think if we had somebody to represent us, that would be fantastic. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you.